So I wound up writing the Gaming Control Act. No. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so so that's that kind of got me started that direction. Uh, then after that, um, the Attorney General at the time was uh, Mike Moore, who I had known and supported when he ran. And the he got a call from the Attorney General in Nevada who basically said, do you realize what y'all have done? He said, y'all have legalized gambling, but you have not regulated it. All right, guys, welcome to Kathy and Susie's Kids. Um, uh, Jordan, Matthew's not here. He's taking a nap, I think. Um, I am here with uh, Scott Levenway. Is it Esquire? How do you say that? Uh, well, I never used the Esquire, but yeah, that's... A, that's kind of cool, uh, though. It is. It's kind of... Um, so, let's let's just start off back. Um, what inspired you to go to college to study law? Study law. Um, I had had been in the military after finishing undergraduate school and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do and I, I so I applied for law school and I applied for uh, graduate school in psychology wasn't really sure which one I was going to do I didn't make up my mind um, I had graduate I had ma- majored in psychology as an undergrad my dad taught psychology at Millsaps so I was kind of attracted to it uh, but the law was out there too, so I, I was uh, uh, accepted to both graduate school and law school up at Ole Miss. My wife at the time uh, was uh, looking for a job, and she didn't get one as we came back home from being in the military. So I went out and got a job teaching junior high mathematics in Florence, Mississippi. What? Yeah. Tenth grade. Uh, seven and nine. Uh oh. Okay. And but I had a had a wife and a child, and I was making five hundred dollars a month. About halfway through the year, I said I got to get a trade. <laughs> 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 so so I started law school, and so I finished up uh, nighttime law school, um, um, and and worked throughout that time um, full time, and then went to school at night. Uh, so that's how I got the law degree. Um, but the, the, the real career change was not law. The real career change was when I got into the political side of it. I was clerking for a judge after I graduated and somebody said, they're looking to hire some attorneys over at the house of representatives. And, um, said, really? I said, well, you know, I don't have a regular job yet. And so let me go see. So I went over and interviewed. They hired me on the spot, started immediately. Session started in two weeks, started drafting bills. Prior to that time, the uh, legislature had relied upon attorneys that were provided by the attorney general's office, and they set up a desk, or two desks actually, outside the chamber of the House and the Senate. So there were four attorneys that just took requests out in the open, everybody walking around, and so they decided that they needed to start hiring their own attorneys and put them in a room where you could go in and have an attorney-client conversation. Um, so they hired, I think they hired either six or eight of us. I'm trying to remember. Probably six. Um, and are we talking this in the 70s? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to picture in my head. like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing this. 40 something years now so just back it out yeah. they get you back down into the 70s before cell phones yeah you're right <laughs> yeah yeah well actually i had a cell phone um after that yeah that's true the first cell yeah. phone i got was <laughs> was one of those stock phones yeah that they that they mounted on the floor oh yeah yeah, yeah. of the car you I've, know? I've seen them in cars i've yeah. never owned one but i've seen them in cars you know yeah. you bought a mercedes back then and it came with a mercedes <laughs> edition <laughs> Yeah, no, this one, I actually put, I had my little um, uh, uh, Toyota camera. Yeah. So you had, so there's four of y'all that were picked. That's what you're Yeah, saying. or six or whatever. Yeah. So we, they worked us through the session. And then at the end of the session, they kept two and let the others go. And I was fortunate to be selected to stay. Um, 
And so I wound up spending, I guess, a total of four years uh, working just for the House of Representatives, um, doing legislative drafting work, uh, working with different committees, uh, just getting to know that process and falling in love with that process. I have a huge amount of respect for the people that serve in that body. Uh, I know a lot of people have different opinions about the people that serve. We all have opinions. Everybody everybody has opinions. Yeah. That's true. But the one that I have about this is that I have a tremendous respect for the people that are willing to serve and sacrifice because people don't realize the sacrifice that they go through financially and otherwise. It's just, it's it's tough. Go to come to town for three months, four months, however long. This last year, it was like every other week they were in town. Yeah. And back home, they got a business they're trying to run. They got a family they're trying to take care of. The kids are trying to raise. And you got to go through the whole passing bills and going back and forth. How are you going to get the fund in? Right. I mean, it's that, yeah, yeah. It's not just one thing. No, it's not. <laughs> it's re- it's really not. But that's what that was serendipitous. And I just happened to go over and, and interview and got hired by uh, Buddy Newman, uh, who was the Speaker of the House back then. Um, called him, he was known as Scandalbooger. <laughs> and then now, how to get his nickname? Like, now that I don't know, okay. <laughs> he, he, he had Scandalburger before he was speaker. I do know that when he got elected speaker, all the his supporters said, "Now, now, buddy, you have to be known as as Mr. Speaker from now on. It's a it's a title, and then you've earned it, and and you need to do that." No, 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 no. I says, "No, no, I'm 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 just Scandalburger." You just call me Scalabur. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on, man. That's kind of cool, though, you know? Yeah, it really is. But, yeah. So, yeah, he finally became Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, in your um, government relations, lobbying, um, the things that you've done, uh, you've seen a lot of faces. Oh, yeah. You've seen a lot of hats change. You've, I mean, that's a lot. Like, you know, w- w- how long was he Speaker for? Oh, buddy was Speaker probably either three or four terms. He was there for 12 years or um, maybe 16. Really? I, historically, our speakers stay for a long time. Once they get elected, uh, they're, they usually stay until they're older. Uh, Junkin was before him. I think Junkin served uh, 20-something years. Um, and then Buddy Newman and... Uh, then we started rolling into Tim Ford and, and other people that we've got. And our current speaker now is uh, working on 12 years. He's uh, uh, So it's, um, you know, it, it's there's value in continuity because the historical knowledge that you have is valuable in that process. Uh, you know, Mississippi actually at one point in time tried to do term limits on the members. And it was something that was sweeping the country, and it was passing everywhere. And and the people of Mississippi didn't see it the same way. They defeated the constitutional amendment like 80-20. Uh, uh, said, no, we want people to know what they're doing. They've been there, have seen it, and done it. I think my big thing with term limits is just because I'm so tired of watching Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm no. sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, I just, I've, I've tried to, like, for some of the, I've tried to, like, listen to her speech. She don't speak. Like, if you dive into her, like, talking and stuff, she, trip, she, she like, trips over words and stuff. And it's like, it's more of we're doing stuff, but it's not like talking to the people. So that, for me, it was always like, okay, this is, when you start feeling like they got some, they're kind of tripping their words and they're not there. I mean, I've watched some of this stuff lately with some of these older people in the office that, like, are passing out. I mean, there's a whole, like, meme set up now where you, like, on live TV, these people are watching people sleep. You know, and it's it's focused on them. Like, it's just like you're watching them, everybody sleep. And I think, you know, being 34, you're like, you know, this is politics. And that's... Yeah, yeah. I, I will say this. It's different on national level than it is on local level. Yeah in that there's so much money involved on the national level. So, I mean, uh, Speaker Pelosi has been there for so long in her district, and uh, she has more money than anybody else will have that tries to run against her. Uh, It's very difficult to defeat an incumbent uh, representative or senator in Washington. It's much easier in Mississippi 
we had the late night session, oh, let's just say 20 years ago uh, in Mississippi, and the media, somebody took a picture at midnight when they were at one of these late night deadlines, and you had to be there, committees were meeting, last minute stuff on, on conference reports, which is the end of the session, when you kind of reconciled everything. And there's a couple of these guys that were sitting in their chairs, and it was midnight. They didn't have the committee that was working that particular night that was on that deadline. And they just laid back in the chairs and fell asleep. Well, somebody took a picture. A, took a picture. Oh, uh, so, so what I see sometimes and, and, is not. And they put it in the paper. Oh, uh, and it was just like a little cat nap kind of style. Like it was. Yes. Oh, it, man. Both of, them, <laughs> both of them got defeated the next time when they ran for re-election. Just that one picture. That one picture. Photography is very powerful. It is. It's you know, very powerful. What you show. Yep. I mean, I wish we'd show more positive things. Yeah. You know, because there's a lot of stuff that, I mean, you've been a part of um, some great, uh, some, I would say, um, well, how would you say this? Uh, uh, how would you use the word of like uh, victories? I guess you could say you, you've, you've been a part of some victories that have, I would say, bettered um, the development of Mississippi um what the the like the airport was one um you're you're part of that project right right and 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 now you can fly to orlando (laughs) for for, 100 bucks or 49 dollars or whatever the special day is i I was there and i I, when i was there when you uh when you're working that and, and you put your heart into that but like you put you brought something together where it was very it's it's affordable for families to go to disney now Right, you know, like, you know, yeah. it's simple. Th- it's simple things that you don't realize. Yeah, that you know, I, it was kind of cool that you did that with Gulfport. You, 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 you got that plane in there, and they went from. Now you go to Gulfport to Orlando. Now you can go from Gulfport to Austin, and that puts us on a map because most time is is like you got to fly out of New Orleans if you're going to get on a big flight. You know, and and to bring things like you know, right. a one. Uh, I don't like the delays. I don't yeah. like all that. I'd prefer not to. I, I want to go straight there and straight back. Yeah. Oh, I know. I, and nobody wants to. Is there any uh, other big <laughs> things that you can remember, like that you've been a part of, where you're like, "What?" Probably, um, I've been involved with a lot of different things that I'm that I'm proud of. Uh, everything from getting the sales tax exemption for the sale of Girl Scout cookies. That's dope. <laughs> you know, it was like it was like a you know, it was almost. The, yeah, you know, they weren't even really paying you anything. It was like it's just something that they asked you to do and needed to get done. You know, how much money did you save by doing that over the years? Have the, oh, I don't know. Wow, I don't know. It's it's difficult. All them thin minutes I buy. Kids, these kids go out and try and collect seven percent. You know, yeah, yeah. you just have Ma- a, it's you, math, math. Yeah, you're yeah, like it's so it's, the box right there. Then it's going to be you know, right. I want I want five boxes, and they got to yeah. I, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. So I mean, there's little there's little things like that, um, and then there's you know there's different um, uh, issues. Probably the biggest thing that I've been involved in is um, is gaming. Um, the um, I had I worked for the legislature for four years. In the last year that I was there, I worked for one legislator solely. Uh, um, an attorney from up in the Delta for Greenville. His name was Sonny Meredith, and he was um, uh, he was the smartest guy that I ever met uh, when it came to the legislative process. Uh, people play chess; they play two dimensional chess. Well, Sonny played three dimensional chess. Oh snap! He was he was so far ahead of everybody, and he had already planted ideas and thoughts. Um, to the point that I've kind of, in my in my practice as a as a, as a government relations person, I have adopted kind of his policies and philosophy. And people ask me what I do for a living. I said, "Well, I, I plant acorns." <laughs> yeah, have you said that to me before? Yeah, I know. You know so you yeah, kind of got that from Sonny a little yeah, bit. I got it. I definitely got it from Sonny. You put ideas and thoughts out there, and then when it comes back up, somebody else that comes to mind. They then own it. It's their own idea. It's not me trying to sell something. It's me supporting an idea that somebody else has that's part of the process. Yeah. And once you get to that point, then you're you're on the way. You're on your way. 
Um, but anyway, I worked for Sonny that last year. Um, he was chairman of the judiciary. And um, so I thought, oh, that'd be good work just for judiciary because um, <clears throat> with my background, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do, I'll probably do criminal defense and sanity stuff. And then I learned about the law and McNaughton rule, which basically in Mississippi, there is no insanity defense, if you will. But uh, so anyhow, I worked for Sonny for a year, just him. Um, then I went to work for an attorney in town. And uh, one of the reasons that he hired me was because he had a little bit of lobbying type work in his in his practice. And uh, so that way I could do that as well as be an associate for him. Uh, so at the end of the session, I was up at the Capitol Again, I talked about this before, but the end of the session is what we call conference time. They committees meet, three from each yeah. side, sit down, work out the details, come back with something, and then both sides have to vote on the final version. So I was hanging out. I had one little bill, and Sonny saw me in the hall, and he said, what are you doing? I said, not not much, not much, really. I just a little bill. He says, well, we're short-staffed. Would you mind staffing a, a conference report for us? And I said, sure, be glad to do that. And so I walked in there. Well, that conference report turned out to be the Gaming Control Act. So I wound up writing the Gaming Control Act. No. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> so, so so that's that kind of got me started that direction. Uh, then after that, um, the Attorney General at the time was uh, Mike Moore, who I had known and supported when he ran and. The, he got a call from the Attorney General in Nevada who basically said, do you realize what y'all have done? He said, y'all have legalized gambling, but you have not regulated it. He said, you're going to launder the world of drug money through the Mississippi River. And he said, let me send you one of our attorneys. And you give me somebody in Mississippi, and they can sit down and write the regulations. Um, so Mike called me up and asked me if I would be willing to do that, which I did. And none of this was paid stuff. It was just somebody asked you to do it. Get and, your foot in the and door. You, and you do it, you know. It's, it's like everybody should know. Like that's a, I mean, this is, I think even with me, like, I mean, you, you have an opportunity. Sometimes it's not going to come in a paycheck. Yeah, you know, I wasn't even thinking of no, that. No, you just, wanted to. It's it's when the attorney general of the state asks you, will you do something for me? You do it. Yeah, you, you do. do it. You know. You hear that, guy? So if you, that's you, what you do you it. Do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do. I admire that. So, so I did that, and. So it, this guy's name was Scott Shearer, and uh, so the two Scots wrote the regulations, uh, and they very much parallel um, what we have in Nevada. That's why they ended up that way, because he was from Nevada, and that was kind of our start point. Um, and we had done it right in that we didn't have a limited number of licenses like Louisiana. Yeah. They only had like 15 licenses. Well, that means... That, that opens it up for the potential um, for um, undue influence, people trying to, there's only 15. In Mississippi, if you are a, a qualified person, you got the finances in the background, you're going to build a casino. We can have as many as we want if, if you come in you qualify. So it does away with the politics. It takes all that out, and it just gets down to a pure business. And if you put somebody out of business, then it does. That's the business is open and fail. Restaurants do that all the time. We don't really want casinos to do that, and we fortunately have not had a great deal of that, but we've had some of it. But anyhow, so I wrote the, the Gaming Control Act. Then I wound up writing the regulations, and then uh, I happened to get the first casino client that came to the state. And, and who was that? Uh, that was Bernie Goldstein out of the Quad Cities. He had the out of Capri. And um, we first got him licensed in Natchez, and then he realized that he needed to be in Biloxi or wanted to be there. I don't blame him. And um, it was it was kind of sad in that we had gotten li- I'd gotten a license number one in Mississippi in Natchez, and we gave it up, got a new license in in Biloxi, and they brought a riverboat down because he had some riverboats up there and we just sailed right past Natchez and went around and hooked up in <laughs> Biloxi and opened up 
Were you that? Um, were you were you there the first day it opened? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who was um, Jamie Krill's dad? Yeah. Um, who's that? Uh, uh, Billy. Billy, Billy Krill. Yeah, yeah, really nice guy. I used to go down uh, with my dad. Fabulous guy. It, yeah, Miss Tourism. That is so cool. So you, I mean, how many pages? <laughs> you wrote two. I mean, that's that's huge. I mean, that's a lot of yeah, yeah. That's a lot of writing. Sure, sure, it is. It, it, it's a lot, uh, and. It was, it was interesting because at the time, um, a lot of the big law firms, particularly in Jackson, were reluctant to get into representing gaming clients because of, of morality of it. Um, the, the certain firms are basically associated with certain churches. So you've got the First Baptist Firm, you've got the First Pres Firm, you've got the Galloway Methodist Firm. You know, you have all these that kind of identify with a particular church. Oh, yeah, and they got rules on and, tattoo and, shops and, to having a strip club. So, so they initially shied away from it, and that kind of left it open for a guy like me. It was, we had a two-man shop at the time, and we got involved with everything from helping run the campaigns to legalize it in each jurisdiction where they had to come up to then representing them um, and uh, getting them licensed and then representing them in the political arena and, and making sure that the industry was was protected in that in that manner. I probably represented probably a dozen different casinos um, during my career. That's insane. So, I mean, that's I mean, that's a huge story. So it's like because, I mean, we have casinos here and, and, and they're they're their money helps the community and you see it in the roads. You sure. see, I mean, I, you, you see the development, um, you know, uh, we just got off the, uh, the pink dress run, um, with Les, shout out to Les, John, Alicia, the whole team. But, you know, we, we've done the pink dress run in downtown Gulfport, which, you know, John's family has Island View Casino, right. but they are always supporting us. Right. Rick, you know, his dad's always kind of, when y'all going to give it up kind of thing, you know, it's, he's a very, He's a father, and you know he's uh, he's a serious guy. But you know, I, he he's definitely been proud of what we've accomplished. But that yeah. just shows you, you know, when we say we want to raise money or make a difference in Gulfport, they're there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I have the respect for. I was like, wow. Yeah. Because if you if we're trying to make a difference, Rick's signing off. Right. And and, and that's just not with us. Let's look at the Harbor Lights and everything they contribute. You know, they're a big part of the Harbor Lights. Oh, I know. So I they, know, you know, absolutely. like when you drive by there and you're and you're seeing Jones Park, Island View is a big part of that. Sure. And sure. it's it, so you know, growing up, well, I'm born in '86, but I, I grew up going to the Lady Luck and watching the Dragon. You know, I grew up going to Grand Casino and the Play Center and the Boomtown, and you know, uh, I've but I've seen over the years how much nicer our roads are, the development, and you, I mean. It's money. It's it's very real money, and it's had a, a huge impact on the economy of not only the coast, but of the state as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, helped to grow. In growing the, the economy of the coast, it also grows the influence of the coast. Um, and the people on the coast are probably better represented politically right now uh, than they have been in a long, long time. But you're talking about uh, Rick Carter. Uh, I represented Rick in the early days, um, and in, in fact, he was on another show recently, um, uh, talking about how they got their business established yeah. and the the history and all that on it. And uh, I was listening to it, and it's the first time I've ever been called a, a young whippersnapper. <laughs> uh, but that's how Rick referred to me. Uh, they had. Um, they had the issue of the original boats doing cruises to nowhere, and they had the problem with it dragging and slowing down, and they had to go 12 miles out. And so they went to the legislature to try and change the law to allow them to only go out to the city limits, and that was 1,500 feet or yards, whichever that was, I don't call which. And so they, and it was late in the session, and the Deadlines had passed to get bills and all introduced. You can, legislature has its own set of rules. And with a two-thirds vote, they can change those rules and do whatever they want. So this 
required a two-thirds vote. And so they had hired someone else to work on it, and they, they just weren't quite just weren't quite getting there. And uh, they were represented at that time by uh, a friend of mine from law school, uh, Hugh Keating, who, who brought them to town. They met with me, and they hired me. Long story short, at the end of the day, we got that passed. Um, and so that's why Rick, <laughs> Rick said this young whippersnapper because the other guy was an established long time yeah. very successful lobbyist mm-hmm. up there there's no there's yeah. no feeling when you your achievement though in, in, this, sure. in this realm where you know like there's a way yeah sure and, and you're gonna find that way sure you're not giving up oh, you read every manual like i mean you're <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's, it is it is yeah i know i, know. I read manuals <laughs> look knowledge is power in the in the process, when I meet new members come in, yeah. first thing I tell them is, go read the rules. You got to know the yeah, rules. Know. <laughs> It'll make you stronger and more powerful than the guy, yeah. your decimate, because if he doesn't know. I have watched legislators that know the rules tie the legislature up such that they couldn't even adjourn with, with, with procedural-type motions and things like that. Um, and it's very, very powerful. Um, so I always knew the rules, and I also try and know everything there is to know about my client. And I also have a 24-hour rule. If I have a member that asks me a question I can't answer, I get them an answer within 24 hours. So it's all about information flow and knowledge. and um, That's key. That, and it's never over. It's never over until it's over. The Girl Scout cookies? Yeah. I passed that as the last bill of the session on the floor of the Senate, they actually called a committee meeting in the back corner of the chamber in the Senate, met, brought that code section out, and brought it to the floor and said, if you amend it, it's dead. Do you want to go on a record as being against the Girl Scouts? And I passed the bill. It was the last one, and they adjourned and went home for the year. That's sick, man. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that, and that's cool because, I mean, I think, I think anybody, it doesn't matter what career you're in, make more of an effort it's kind of what sure. your your secret is is well i got a client i'm gonna learn everything about my client i'm going to win i mean sure i mean i've i've i've, I've always you know admired you through i uh, mean scott's um uh, taught me about bourbons to cigars to um understanding he built this table <laughs> yeah. so he's made this table you know and it's uh every time i'm like hey scott i'm starting a podcast all right, but are you going to do it kind of thing? And it's like, and, and I have accomplished in this last 10 months with me and Matt, and you've been a big support of it, but we're doing it. And we're giving a platform. It's similar to what you're doing, but we're starting to give a platform for people that can tell their story. Right. You know, a, a person that can look up to you and, and pull this video up and go, well, that made me feel better. You got right. people that come up to me and they give me a hug and I listen to your podcast in a tree stand. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, but it started with this table and I said, you know, it's, it started with the idea and then let's just do it. You built this wall, you know, you did. I mean, you, that's true. Yeah. yeah we, we did that too. We built yeah. it. So, I mean, you've been a big part of this, uh, of, you know, of, of my ideas and, you know, all over one of them just have a conversation and, and, and give a platform, you know, we're going on like 43, 44 episodes and it's just like, I'm getting it. I'm getting why I'm doing this. And I hope you can, you know, see that now that yeah. it's like, yeah, I do. Or you can be like, hey, you know, because if you run in the different media outlets, you're only going to get, like you said, that one picture. Some people have to take a nap. Some people are tired. They take one picture and it changes their whole entire life. And given this kind of platform where it's, you know, 30 minute segment, you know, and it's 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 something that I'm I'm proud of. It's when I whether it's Ivan or John comes over or, or whoever I podcast with, it's, you know, we took, I always bring this up, but Dr. Sean Amusial, you know, pharmacist, never wanted to be called doctor, gets off the podcast. He's like, I think he's podcast number uh, three. He gets off podcast now, people call him Dr. Amusial. So it's like, it's kind of that, it's not sure. right in the contracts, but you're, you're giving that person a voice because the biggest things that, that I'm, I'm learning about people is they're so quick to judge and it's, it's serious. And it's, and especially with a fast paced society, it's like 
you know, if you make that wrong post, you, you know, if you, you if, if you're having a bad day and you see somebody at a bar and you're just having a bad day and you, and you come off a certain way, well, there's going to be 17 different versions of how you acted. It's not going to be one. <laughs> it's going to be, yeah. well, that story gets twisted in that story. And I, I think I'm very proud of what, what, what me and Matt are accomplishing now. Well, it's all about perseverance and sticking with it. Yeah. My practice didn't grow, didn't happen overnight. It took me a long time to get there. Okay. And, but it, once it gets going, it does. When you had the, your first podcast, mm-hmm. how many I listeners? I was nerve wracking. How many listeners did you have? None, probably. No, I mean, I've had, it's, it's, you probably can go back and look at the records. It's the thing. Yeah. And so I think our, our first, our first downloads, I think our first downloads, we, um, I think it's like 300, something around there, 400. And where are you now today? I mean, it's a lot more. Okay. So, I mean, it's, 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 and, and no, we're just talking about this. So the thing is what I'm learning about us doing the podcast is they discover us and they're going back. So even if I don't podcast, right. They're going back to pick who they want to pick. Cause we have such a diverse group. Of, like it's, everybody's different. I mean, everybody from a nurse anesthetist to a graffiti artist, I mean, to a yeah. football player tomorrow, I mean, like we're going to have Justin on again. I mean, it's just one of the things. So yeah, you're right. And I just got to keep going with it. And I haven't going to give up on it. It's absolutely, it's so rare now. And I'll, I'll make a joke about it, but it takes this to have a conversation now. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, you by don't. This, by this, you mean simply the presence of being here or. Presence of being here. Yeah. It's like, take the mics away and we're just having a conversation. You, you're talking about things that you you've never talked to me about right but these these mics allow us to do that and that's something powerful yeah and then you've got a generation of people that really want to hear that and um well like i said this is part one i would like to have you back on sure all right well cheers to this man and we've been on this uh burble bear uh what was it uh barrel bourbon this is some good stuff yeah i can attest to that (laughs) All right, guys. Well, uh, make sure you uh, follow us uh, on iTunes, Spotify, uh, Audible. We're on Amazon Audible now because, you know, uh, YouTube, Jordan Matthew. um, Yeah, just give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.